Okay, so I'm going to um, share with you my understanding of action research. And you have to bear in mind it's situated within healthcare. And, um, it, and you'll have to try and work out how it might be applied to your own situation. And we can perhaps discuss this as we go along, any variations, because there are different types of action research. And they play out slightly different slightly differently in different areas like education. Okay, so I'm too I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. Right, I'm going to cover um, a d definitions of action research, its key features, its history, its process and its limitations. This is a definition of action research, which I like. It's quite old now. It's by Chemist and McTaggart. It was published in 1988. And it says, action research is simply a form of collective self-reflective inquiry undertaken by participants in social situations in order to improve the rationality and justice of their own situations, their understandings of these practices, and the situations in which these practices are carried out. Now, the important thing to know about action research is actually that it's defined slightly differently, as I said, depending from which discipline you come from. But I particularly like this one because it sums up a lot of the issues. And I just thought it would be fun just to kick off and um, get everybody thinking, is to take out some of the key words from that definition to get, us, to get some of the key features about action research into our heads. So looking at that definition, what strikes you about action research from that definition? Undertaken by participants. Participants, yeah. To improve. To improve, yeah. Any other key words? Collective. Collective, yes. Good. Now what I'm going to do is just try and bring those words to life and provide you with an example of an action research project that I'm currently involved in at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital. The aim of the project at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital is to develop group-based education for patients who have a potentially blinding condition called glaucoma and I'm working with a group of patients, we've got five patients who have recently been diagnosed and are or are established with glaucoma from a range of ethnic groups. We're working with doctors, GPs and optometrists. So we're a collective, we're collectively working together. It's participative um, because we're all working together to solve a problem that has been identified by us all as being important. Patients with glaucoma report frequently that they don't know what eye drops are for. Some of them don't realise that eye drops are for life. Some might not understand that their children might be affected by the condition too. Even if they might not have it now, they could have it in the future. So all in all, quite a few patients might leave the eye hospital with relatively little information about their eye condition. They don't know how best to help themselves and some may go blind needlessly. So that's the social situation, if you like. We're wanting to do something for these patients so um, they don't needlessly lose their sight. So we're trying to create something that's just and fair, hence the justice bit in a sort of UK situation. Okay. Um, it's an inquiry. We're trying to find out how best to do it. It's reflective because as a group, we're sitting down together and critically 
analysing our own sort of ideas and understandings of what group education is and what it could be, what it ought to be, what would the best way to do it. So it's a reflective thing of thinking about what would be the best thing to do. So the patients are contributing to the group by sort of saying, well, I've been attending the eye hospital for 10 years and I've never been told how to put my eye drops in. <laughs> or, or they come along and say, I wasn't told I, my eyes would go red if I put my drops in. And, and it's really made, because the staff are hearing what the patients have got to say, they're recognising and beginning to understand the limitations of their own practice, you see. So, um, so we're really trying to move from what is current practice to improve it, to make it better. Now, there's lots of other kinds of research that attempt to try and make things better. But what distinguishes action research from other forms of research? Well, when we carried out the HDA systematic review um, in 2001, we determined that these two key points were the two things that made action research stand out and differentiate it from other forms of research. And that was that it was a cyclic process. It aims to move from trying to work out exactly what the problem is, analysing the problem and finding out about it as a group, and then moving towards planning what you might do about it to make it better, taking action as a group, and then evaluating it. So it's a cyclic process of which involves some kind of action intervention or change process. It's the research partnership is very significant. The role between being a researcher and being the research is heavily blurred because the, the patients are researching, in, the patients are saying are researching as well, the doctors are the research assistant that's helping is learning too. So it's very much a partnership between people in order to improve a situation. Working with them so people are understanding their own situation and feel able from the knowledge of understanding their situation to change things for the better, i.e. to empower them. And it's, a research, and it's based on a research partnership, but when you actually look at the published research, the actual degree of participation varies, and sometimes it can vary from co cooperation, where they're just not doing a great deal, they're very much a passive partner, to direct collective action. And you might see that more in um, community development action research projects, where the communities are taking action for themselves. So these distinguishing features, this is how action research can vary so much. Um, the kind of intervention might vary. Just how many times they go through a cycle can vary. The degree of research partnership can vary. And so you can see that action research isn't a sort of single, a single thing. It's so very, very varied. Now, I thought you might find it quite interesting to consider how it differs from more traditional forms of research to get it sort of properly in your head, how action research differs. So in the column I've got here, uh, in this diagram I've got here, I've got three columns. The left-hand column, I've got epistemology, the research problem, methods, research participants, researcher roles and analysis. Next column is quantitative, and in the right-hand column, I've got action research. So I've tried to put a descriptor in order to say, um, um, to, in order to help you understand how action research plays out according to these descriptors here. Okay, so I'll just explain them. So action research is sometimes um, underpinned by critical theory which is a philosophy that's very interested in, in, in um, 
changing people's lives, it's about improving the justice of people's situations. It can be underpinned, the information, by um, qualitative paradigms, interpretivism, etc. as well. And it can also be underpinned by another paradigm, by reason inherent, it's called the participative paradigm too. So the, again, this is why action research can vary. You know, there's people take different philosophical stances when they're carrying it out. But if we take critical theory as the example, critical theory long ago, for those of you who don't know much about it, comes long ago from ideas to do with Karl Marx, to do with emancipation and things like that. Okay, so action research, it's interesting in understanding, improving stuff and change, yeah? As I've already said, it's very cyclical. The data that's generally collected can be, is usually qualitative. Sometimes it's quantitative. I've actually carried out a randomised control trial in the middle of an action research project. So it's not exclusively qualitative. It depends upon what the needs of the project are. Okay. And it's generally evolving, which means that when you set out, you might not necessarily know at the start of the project what methods you're going to use. It depends upon what you decide you want to find out and how you need to get the answer to that question. So it's evolving. So you've never, you don't quite know where you're going to end up when you carry out a quali uh, an action research project. You have your overarching goal of what you want to achieve, but you work out along the way how to get there, depending upon what you find on the way. So the research participants, as you've probably gathered, are active. They're there because they want to do something about the situation that they find themselves in. So the patients were there, in the example that I gave, because they wanted to help other patients in the future. They realised the, the importance of uh, what we were trying to do. The doctors and the nurses and the optometrists had seen the results of people not understanding their condition and not putting their drops in. So people are very active. They want to take part, they want to do something about it. There are always, there should always be volunteers. Quite often you can read about action research projects that don't work. And it's often because an outside researcher has gone in and tried to foist a project on a group of people who aren't necessarily that interested in it. Okay. Um, researcher roles. Um, very much involved, very much participating and taking part. They're trying to affect the change with the group. And the analysis is very contextualised. You're trying to identify what the problems and issues are. So you're trying to identify what the tensions are that you're going to have to solve in order to move forward. And it's very much into complexities very much into trying to understand complex social situations and to work out the best way to move forward. Right, now then. So, if we move to the other column, traditional quantitative research, let's just go through what the left-hand column will contain in order to help you compare <laughs> the two, okay? So the epistemology of quantitative research is generally positivism. positivism. Yes, have you heard of that term? Yeah. And the research problem is usually geared towards the theory of research. Yes. Generalization. Pardon? Making the uh, generalization. Yes, it's very much about generalization, whereas uh, action research is very local and contextual. Yes, good point. Static. Static, yes, it's not, it's not, it's trying to just answer one question and that question doesn't change, generally. So what do the research participants, if they're active in action research, what are they generally <laughs> in quantitative research? 
passive, yes. And research researcher roles, they're usually yes, thank you. Detached and the analysis is statistical, it's all about objectivity. So now you've got a basic idea of that action research is quite different to more traditional, conventional forms of research. And in fact, it's quite interesting because it's actually turning the normal conventional ideas of research right on its head. You're suggesting that the researcher gets involved and tries to do things and tries to make a difference. Whereas in traditional randomised controlled trials, the researcher has to make sure he doesn't contaminate the study or cause any sorts of bias or anything. So the uh, action researchers love to be able to change things and make a difference. So it turns traditional notions of what is good research on its head. And that's why it sort of stands out of mainstream research a bit. And some people who come from very conventional scientific laboratory-based settings find it quite hard to understand action research. That's why. But action researchers argue very strongly that unless you get in there and you're working with people who have a problem, you won't make things any better. That's what they kind of argue. If people own problems and care about them enough to be able to investigate them and to try and work out solutions, put them into practice, those changes are going to be more sustainable. So it's very much geared towards social change, um, things like that, organisational change, um, and so on. So I'm going to run through a little bit of the history of action research. You might have heard of Kurt Lewin before, in other contexts, yeah? yeah? What can you remember? Uh, he wanted to work with workers. That's right, and yes. And he came with collaboration of the workers so that they would be able to perform better. That's right. He was interested in group dynamics in factories and how you could increase productivity. But having said that, he came from uh, Poland and was a Jewish emigre to um, America. And in America, he developed um, social psychology. He's very well known for his force field analysis, freezing and unfreezing in change processes. Is they ringing any bells? Yes, good. Okay, so he's very often credited with coining the name of action research. But unfortunately, he died in 1947 with a heart attack and never actually saw many of his experiments through. He used to call them experiments, and he wasn't really so much geared towards social emancipation. He's criticised nowadays that he was using group techniques, getting people to work together as a group would help people to change their practice and do as the group is going towards. He very much understood the power of groups, um, but he tended to use it as a technique rather than as a kind of principle that it's good to get people to work together to free them from what things are sort of oppressing them. Then there was a decline in action research, um, and that's because it was viewed as too much like activism by the government at the time, and also some new statistical techniques were coming to the fore, and everyone went along those sorts of lines, and action, the interest in action research declined for a little while. And then Lawrence Stanhouse um, is credited as raising its profile again with the teacher's researcher movement. Now you'll know that from education, do you? Yeah, teacher's researcher movement. Um, and the rise of educational action research. He very much um, criticised a lot of research in educational practices for not being very relevant to actual teaching. And he said, the people that should be doing the research should be the teachers. And that's how teacher as researcher notion came about. And then from the 1980s, there's been a growing interest in all sorts of fields, health, social care, and police. So, the rise of action research in education, it's 
quite similar to the rise of action research and healthcare, social care too. And I'll just go through this. There was felt to be, as I said before, that traditional research couldn't, wasn't really answering the questions that practitioners on the ground floor had. It wasn't very good at problem solving traditional forms of research, survey research and um, sort of experimental research didn't really help people overcome those things that were bothering them and causing conflict. And there was a feeling that action research was particularly well suited to do that kind of stuff. There was a dis dissatisfaction with top-down approaches, people determining from above, from the research councils, what the research questions ought to be, and um, the research coming top-down, being guided top-down. Whereas, um, and it links in with the other issue, that really the questions that needed answering weren't actually ones that were being studied. There was a shrinkage of research funds. There was also a feeling that traditional research approaches generated research findings, generated theory, um, and that took a long time, if ever, to be implemented. So it was creating a theory practice gap. Whereas action research, because it's very much about um, looking at what the problem is, planning action and trying to solve it, it's very much about closing the theory practice gap. And the idea that there was a lack of relevance of academic research. So what types of improvement can you do? What types of project? Now these are um, health examples of all projects I've been involved in. Um, you can have technical projects where the improvement is a technical improvement. So for example, um, in this one, we developed a questionnaire with 17 general practices uh, from Wales and England. And the questionnaire was aimed at, it was aimed at asking patients what they thought about general practices. Um, it was a satisfaction questionnaire basically for the patients to fill in when they went to their GP. That's what it was about. So that was a technical one. And patients were involved and doctors were involved in the generation of that questionnaire. They worked with us on the project all the way through. The educational example I've just told you about, um, where we're generating a group-based educational programme for patients with glaucoma. The professional one, we did this study in Kenya. We worked with a group of um, AIDS healthcare workers and uh, we worked with them in order to improve the, the professional care that they were delivering to patients living with HIV and AIDS in Kenya. So for service delivery, for example in the care of patients with hyperemesis gravidarum, that means women who have got very severe nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, um, such that they become dehydrated, very listless. The care traditionally was geared towards giving physical interventions like IV drips to rehydrate them. But staff felt that there were other aspects of care that were being played down or ignored, like the need for social support, perhaps psychological support too. So the Action Research Group developed the service provided to these women so that all aspects of care were properly attended to. So those are different types of improvement that I've been involved with with Action Research. Any questions on that? Can you, can you see how in your own circumstances you might be able to think of a technical project or an educational or professional or a service delivery project in your own field. Now, I'm bringing this one in because it's my little bugbear. Most people think that because action research is about just getting a group of people together, it's a management technique and you don't need to spend any money on it. <laughs> well, I totally disagree with that. If you're going to do a good action research project, you need proper resources for it. And that's because 
in today's climate with the cuts in healthcare, police, education, you'll not get people to participate in your project unless you've got some way of persuading the managers to release them from their workplace. So whether you're in social care or whether you're trying to build sustainable environments and you're wanting to work, say, with a group of environmentalists, they've got to be freed from their everyday work to attend this. And you won't get cooperation, even if they want to cooperate, unless you've got some way to get them released. Now, so sometimes, so sometimes you can pay money um, so somebody else can go and stand in for them while they're not there. Or you can get, or if you can get it on the agenda, if you can get it on the uh, management's agenda so that they see that there's a need for it, it fits in with their business policy, they will support it. And that's, so even though you might have a, <coughs> ideas of wanting to work with people and empower them you can't empower them I find ironically without working with the management and getting them on board you have to we have to do that costs need to be covered for the improvement so for example in that group based educational program for glaucoma patients we the costs are uh, hiring a room so you can provide the actual program for the patients, paying for models of eyes, paying for the printing of educational material, paying for the eye drops, that the artificial tears actually, that patients will practice with, so on. So we had to pay for those. For the um, Action Research Project in Kenya, we had to pay for the hire of rooms, we had to pay for food and accommodation for people. So there are, to get things going and to pay for the improvement, you have to do, you have to find money. If you don't find the money, what you end up doing is, is not, it's not as good as it could be. Yeah. Yeah. You have to cost it in as a staff. Cost. Just cost it in as a normal, like you might cost in for a statistician, yeah. cost in the staff time. What about the patients? Uh, cost, uh, very important to pay for patients' time. In the NHS, we have to pay something like £50 for half a day, something like that, of their involvement. Is that not ethical compensation? Right, well, our, if you look on the NHS Involve website, their view is that the, the uh, professionals are getting paid to attend, so why not the patients? They're using their time, and in a natural research project, we meet every month. There's a big commitment to meet every month for an afternoon. They could be working in that time, couldn't they? You made the argument for a distinction between reimbursement and incentive. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. It is. They're very, very hot on, on um, patients being paid for their time. We, we will sometimes give vouchers instead of giving cash. We found that um, some of our patients don't like getting vouchers and some of them don't like being paid because it upsets the benefits that there are. So it's very difficult to know what to do. But the thing is, if, you, if your ethics um, body, you have to go along with what they expect to see and what they want to see. And ours definitely want to see payment nowadays. Sorry, I just got one question about, could you please say more about how to persuade the management back or to participate? I mean, oh, especially right. like, well. as a student, we don't have enough funding. We cannot, well, to reward the participants. So in this case, how Okay, well, when you're, first, when you're first identifying what the problem is, what the issue is that the group of people wish to solve, and you identify that problem by considering, is there any conflict, is there any tensions, are there things that are bothering people um, that need sorting out? 
And if you want to involve the management, you can, you can think, well, what issue do the managers want sorting out? And the managers, with this study that we're doing, have taken on this whole issue about patient education as a quality improvement initiative. They had to find a quality improvement project in the eye hospital. And we happened to come along. And so it, what we wanted to do met their needs. And so they're, they're very, very supportive of it now. And they want it to carry on after the study's finished. So if you can identify what it is that the management need to achieve, and it matches up with what you want to achieve, you've got greater chance of it working. You just have to... You have to be, um, you have to know the context, you know what it is, where, who are the stakeholders and what the stakeholders each want to achieve. It's really important. And you'll see projects fail because they've chosen something that, that the, the, the rest of the organisation, and nowadays when we're talking about cuts, if the rest of the organisation is <coughs> not interested in it, you won't get support, however much there might be vocal support. Oh, yeah, yeah, I really think it's a good idea. They just won't be able to come along. So get management support. Get them along to the group. You know, I said in this group, um, I've, I've got the consult The consultants are part of this study. Consultants have a lot of power in, in, in healthcare. Um, so you might be, want to get the headmaster along. Who, which person who holds the power? within um we're doing ours in lancashire and we have various people in high positions yeah. in lancashire that um i think one of them is going to add this as part of a phd of hers as well so i'm very lucky my contacts that's are all in good. place that's good so i haven't really mentioned this before until now that part of action research the thing that makes it work is that there is an analysis of power relationships one of the first things, one of the fact finding is whose positions of power are going to be threatened by the study? How do you need to work with them in order to try and make them feel so that they're not threatened, that they're part of the process of change? Um, right. This is the, since we're talking about process. Sorry, you might want to put the disclaimer aside. All right. Yeah. I really see why the management would be persuaded that that's a good uh, initiative from a quality improvement point of view. But then how do you make the case that that, 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 that um, piece of work is relevant outside the context of just that hospital? Oh, right. Well, can I just go through this process yeah. here? and I, Remind me, okay. and I will cover it. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, as I said before, you identify a general or initial idea. This is the process of action research. What is it that's bothering you? What's causing conflict? So the conflict was that we were getting a lot of patients who... Um, patients were complaining. They're not getting things they ought to. And they weren't getting the service that they needed. Um, so the first phase, this is Lewin's pathway... But it's so similar to most of the other pathways that are used nowadays. I'm just going to use this one. You do fact finding. So, okay, we, um, we identified that this was an issue. So what did we do? Well, as well as talking amongst ourselves about our prejudices and feelings about what group based education ought to be and critically reflecting, we also looked at the research was there any research already out there on how to run group-based education? Well, had any other projects already been run? And there was one, and it was done <coughs> in Canada, and it was a one-page thing, and it didn't tell us a great deal. Um, we looked at educational theories, and we looked at, soci uh, we looked at social psychological behavioural theories as well to get some ideas to explore the problem. We looked at policies. The NHS policy says patients ought to be given information, but doesn't really talk about educational behavioural interventions, so policy wasn't much good. 
we looked at how um, the services were currently organised in the eye hospital. So we looked at the organisations and we looked at current practices, which is basically a 10 minute consultation in a busy clinic where the doctors are only focused on measuring your eye pressure and giving you an eye drop. So it was felt that education could not be provided in the clinic to the extent that was required. And education would need to be delivered outside in a separate two hour session. And we asked, we, we aimed for 30 patients and we got 27 patients and we interviewed qualitatively 27 patients to find out their views on what um, their issues were to do with education and adherence, what they would like in an educational programme. So we got a bigger group of people's views on what we were doing as well. Now, not all action research projects do that. Some action research projects prefer to keep it within the team and just study it amongst themselves. Now, that's okay, but I deliberate. We deliberately wanted to generate something that would be acceptable beyond the eye hospital because we felt this was a problem, and we know it's a problem, beyond the eye hospital. So we deliberately did that. And you can do that with action research, actually. You can do bigger research within the project itself in order to generate results which you can feel fairly confident are okay. And... Um, we wanted to generate something that we knew would be of use beyond the eye hospital, that's why we did that. So that was all in the fact finding. And then we planned. And what we did, we, we looked at the qualitative interviews, at the policies, at the educational theories and everything, and worked out an educational programme uh, based on 10 learning outcomes. And um, we've run it twice. We've run it twice now. And um, we decided to um, evaluate it in a quantitative, a quantitative and qualitative way in this instance. So you don't have to do it quantitatively. You can do it qualitatively. It depends what you're doing. But since we were interested in adherence, we thought we would measure adherence before the study and afterwards. Uh, before the programme and after the programme, and that's what we've done. We haven't got those results through yet, um, but the feedback we've had from patients is brilliant. They're saying things like, why weren't we given this before? And it's absolutely fantastic. Is there another one? And things like that. So um, it, it's very satisfying when you do action research. If it works, it's extremely satisfying because you really do sort things out. So we've, we're evaluating it. Um, in a conventional way here and um, having been through the process twice now we would actually modify the program slightly we would amend it and then we would run it again so that is just one example of an action research project um, I could give you an example of another type of project and this is called a cooperative inquiry I just wanted to give you an example of this cooperative inquiry because it's more like the kind of action research you'll get in education. I'm working with six people who um, are responsible for getting research into the NHS. And I'm just working with those six people and we're using critical reflection every month to consider and explore, inquire and rationalise how they facilitate the implement of implementation of evidence. So it's very much working with them, it's a very reflective process, very qualitative process. We're recording the meetings as we're going along, we're generating ideas about what facilitation is. It's quite a different process from the one I just described, but it's still action research. Okay, so the roles of action research, the key roles, when you're thinking, when would I want to use it? It's if you want to improve practice, if you want to involve users and staff, and if you're very interested in promoting knowledge and understanding in the people that have got the problem. 
So, the limitations of action research. Can you imagine how people criticise action research? But not generalisable. Not generalisable. Sounds leading. Sounds leading. Why would I do the research and get other people more qualified to do that kind of thing? Okay, we'll run through the we'll answer of all of these. Right. Too, in, too involved, taking on management values. Right. I, I would just like us to consider the counter arguments to these. So if somebody said those to you and you were supporting action research, what would you say in return? So not generalisable, how would you sort of counter that argument from what I've said today? Well, that's kind of the classical one with qualitative research, like not objective. I, I think that that's quite easy. It's just not aimed directly at generalisations as much as not objective. It's not supposed to be objective in any way. It's just, um, it, it's aimed at gaining a better understanding of something and, and changing practices and the knowledge that comes from it is, is definitely constructive, but um, you could argue that knowledge is never, or research is never objective anyway. I think those two are kind of the typical qualitative yes. research. Right. And, and you can use to say what, sometimes what you're interested in doing is like, <laughs> The out, if you think about the outputs also from action research, we've generated, we've got a product, if you like, we've got this action, uh, this educational program, which can be used somewhere else. Um, so there's other aspects to that issue, which you don't often get from conventional forms of research. Okay, value laden. I would actually say in action research, when you've got a group of people together who come from different disciplines and, and include patients as well, you've got doctors, nurses, and you've got them all in the room, you will actually review different values. So I think it's, yes, it is value laden, that's the whole point. You want to, re you want to critically review what each one of your personal values are regarding patient education, um, you want to ensure that what's underpinning your practice is a value that you can live with. And if you're in a group together with a group of people from different disciplines, you're going to hear different arguments, and that's going to expand your understanding of different perspectives. And at the end of the day, you come away with a different view, a more enlightened view about what's underpinning your practice. You've got that rationality. Well, what about Well, my, if you've got a good, that's why you need a researcher in a way. <laughs> um, if you've got a good, if you, it doesn't have to be a researcher, actually, but if you've got a good chair in the group, and you begin the group with ground, you get the group to work out ground rules for behaviour, and people want to be there, they want to change. Um, my experience of working with the GP in that group, he was very quiet, he was inviting the others, the patients to speak, and the patients held the floor. And that was because we also prepared them beforehand. We kind of, um, th that's what the researcher was doing. The researcher was preparing the, the patients to feel comfortable to speak, giving them a demonstration about what they could do, getting them to think about what they could say. Quite often, if you're working with busy people, they can't do all the research, and the researcher was the one that ran off to the library and got hold of the literature and things like that and summed it up. Because in real life, that's why you need a researcher. But you, you don't have to have one. Who's going to analyse all the tapes of the patients that have been interviewed? The staff will read in the meetings, so we'd read some of the interview transcripts and get a feeling for things which would generate a critical discussion. But that you really need someone who's going to have the time to be able to do the research. Presumably, you know the other literature, you can connect it to a broader body of knowledge. Yeah. But couldn't that be problematic in itself? In what way? Well, I mean, my understanding of action is 
Yeah. I've done it myself, yeah, I have, I've done it. And that must be very hard for people who don't actually have any sort of training. And you have to support them. Mm -hmm. um, but the upside, there's, there's an upside to it. Because they're on the level of the people that they're interviewing, quite often they can get things from that interview that if a middle class, very academic researcher had gone in and talked to them about, they might not have grasped. So there's ups and downs to it all. There always is. But you can train them. Um, and some of them, it, I've done it with staff nurses from the eye hospital and other projects. And they learn what the patients are saying to them. So, okay, they might not be very, they might not do it quite in the same way as trained researchers might do it. But the, up, the other upside is, is that they suddenly realise, oh my God, these patients are not controlling their pain. And they realise the need to take action and to change practice. So that's, that's the other angle. Well, one point related to this is maybe we should add to this why do we need an academic researcher? I mean, to well, a certain extent this comes fairly closely to what people in consultancy and that kind of branches are doing or maybe should be doing if they, they take their products in a sort of rational way through the whole process. Um, so what would you see as the main differences from that perspective? Um, it's because the fact finding phase, you can do it in a very sort of change management kind of way and do it in a very basic way or you can do it in more of a research way like we did. We searched the literature and we collected interviews and we did this and we did that and at the end of the day I would like to write a research paper with the participants I've always written research papers with participants their names are always on the papers in order to sort of academically describe another way of doing research in order to sort of move it forward within the academic field and also the actual process let me just go through this the actual process of moving from fact-finding through actually doing something in practice makes you realise things that you've missed from the fact-finding phase. In the fact-finding phase, we did not pick up very well that lifestyle issues were really important to patients. We missed it. When we look back in the interviews, we can see it's there, just. But when we actually did the classroom work with them, they were saying, what about yoga? Does that affect it? What about smoking and weightlifting? Does that affect glaucoma? What can I personally do? And we hadn't picked that up. So going through the process, we actually refine, we, you kind of refine your findings from what you initially think is the issue at the end. And so academically, it's a great, for me, I find it a great process. It really helps sort out what the really, what, turn out to be the important issues. Empowerment. There's a lot of this stuff about empowerment. And you don't really kind of get a feel for it a lot in some of the papers that you read, especially within the NHS. Um, and the whole issue of how much are you really empowering people is, is a debate within action research. Your question here about management of change, how different is it to cha management of change? But it is because it's generally bottom-up. The other issue, data collection versus change. Sometimes change gets, a, um, gets going by itself. Before you've collected all your data, there's this sort of impetus, and you have to balance data collection against change. Ethical issues, writing up and publication, they're all... They're just some of the limitations, but you quite rightly identified some good ones there. So in conclusion, actual research reflects critically on what might or ought to be, rather than what is. Usually conventional research is about what is. Action research is about what, what ought to be. Going back to the issues to do with values, what ought to be there? What do we want to achieve? It's political as it seeks to challenge the status quo. It's because you're wanting to change, you're questioning 
um, current policy practices, so it's political. It improves practice and evaluates the results. Within the participants, it produces knowledge that drives them forward for action. It's carried out by researchers and participants and utilises qualitative and quantitative research depending on what needs to be known. All action researchers are, are a little bit evangelical. <laughs> and research that produces nothing but books will not suffice. That's where most action researchers are coming from. Thank you very much.